Now, category theory has been trending on Twitter or X or whatever Elon wants to call it these days, and it's received a considerable amount of attention. From category theorists, it's portrayed as an elegant theory providing foundation and connecting all other branches of mathematics. However, for the rest of the world, including notable internet smart people, they consider it incoherent abstract circle jerking. And in some sense, they're right. Even professional category theorists colloquially refer to category theory as abstract nonsense. So it follows immediately from abstract nonsense that if there is a category, E and a Lie algebra inside it, with this feature. If you know anything about category theory, then you would know that that's Jacob Lurie, one of the founders of higher category theory. He's basically the main character. To make all this make sense, I'll give you a simple, real-life problem that is solved handily by abstract nonsense. In fact, it's one of my favorite types of theorems. Fixed point theorems. Okay, this is the statement. Consider you had a disk in two dimensions, and you map the disk to itself in a continuous fashion. Well, then the theorem states that this map will always admit a fixed point. This is just another way of saying that when you move around the points in a disk without tearing, ripping, or poking holes, then there's always a point that does not change position. Now, how would we go about proving this theorem? Well, of course, we just need to go through our trusty bag of proof techniques and, uh, it's just contradiction. Some of you may have thought that because this video is about category theory, then we'd prove things through a diagram chase, but fortunately it's just contradiction. Moving on to the actual proof, Consider, for the sake of contradiction, that there exists a continuous function, call it f for function, from the disk to itself that does not admit a fixed point. This means that all points move to a different location. This gives us a pair of distinct points, a starting location and an ending location. One is before f and after f. For each point on the disk, we can draw a line segment through its before and after image. Now this line segment will always intersect the boundary of the disk, also known as the circle. We will now construct a new function, call it g for creativity, that will send each point on the circle to the place where its line segment hits the circle. If the point starts on the circle, we keep it there. Remember, the disk is just the circle, but with everything inside of it. The circle is just the boundary line. I'll skip the details, but using some geometry and some carefully chosen epsilons and deltas, we can show that g is also continuous. Therefore, from our continuous function f, we get a new continuous function g that maps the whole disk to the circle, and keeps what was already on the circle fixed in place. Our whole proof of this theorem rests on the fact that this map g cannot exist, resulting in f being non-existent as well. But first, we have to take a crash course in homotopy theory. How does this relate to category theory? Trust me, homotopy theory and category theory go hand in hand. Homotopy is a frightening word, and unfortunately, it has nothing to do with gays or being topped. What it should really be called is time-based topology, or something. Basically, the idea behind homotopy theory is that we only care about continuous maps that can be transformed into other continuous maps over time. For example, we can transform this function defined as a curve in two-dimensional space into this other curve. This is called the straight line homotopy because we can continuously move each point on curve A to each other point on curve B in a straight line. I can move the slider around and show how far the curve moves at each time segment. At the beginning, it should be on curve A, and on the end, it should be on curve B. When we can continuously morph one function into the other over time, then we say that the functions are homotopic. When two continuous functions are homotopic, we can consider them to be the same function, in a sense. Now, why would we want to consider two different things to be the same? This is because sometimes it's easier to generalize a bunch of different objects that share a common trait. To most people, this is called stereotyping. But to mathematicians, this is called abstraction. Furthermore, in a similar scenario, these curves are not homotopic when we simply remove the origin from two-dimensional space. This is because our curve cannot pass through the hole to become the other curve. Therefore, these continuous maps are not homotopic in this punctured plane, and we view them as distinct. So, we can conclude that the background space that the function lives in, or the codomain, is a determining factor when it comes to homotopy. Now, why does homotopy matter? Because, with our function g, 
and the fact that the disk is convex, we can construct a straight line homotopy for the identity map. For each point in time, we can just make all points move along the line segment from its starting position to its intersection with the circle. This results in a well-defined homotopy between the identity map to G. That means that, homotopically, doing nothing to the disk is the same thing as doing G. This specific collection of continuous functions actually has a special name. It's called a deformation retract. This means that the identity is homotopic to a map that keeps a subspace fixed. In this case, our fixed subspace is the circle. Now we move on to category theory. Recall from middle school, or whenever you first learn abstract nonsense, and remember that a category is a collection of objects along with a collection of arrows between those objects. So, a category is kind of like a directed graph. We can also compose arrows, so if we have an arrow from A to B and B to C, we get an arrow from A to C that is equal to this composition. However, we also impose some algebraic restrictions on the arrows, such as associativity and identity. Associativity means that if we have arrows composed first from the left, then they are equal to being composed first from the right, leaving us with no ambiguity. Identity just means that for each object, there is at least one arrow pointing to itself, being considered the identity arrow, denoted I subscript the object. An isomorphism is a special type of arrow between two objects. Specifically, an isomorphism J from A to B is an arrow with an inverse K, such that these equalities hold. If two objects are isomorphic, then they are essentially the same. For examples of categories, we have set, the category of sets, the objects are sets, the arrows are functions between sets, and composition of arrows is defined as composition of functions. Isomorphisms in this category are bijections. We have top, the category of topological spaces, the objects are topological spaces, the arrows continuous maps, and the composition of arrows is again defined as composition of continuous maps. Isomorphisms in this category are homeomorphisms. We also have the category of groups. The objects are groups, the arrows are group homomorphisms, and composition of arrows is defined similarly. Isomorphisms in this category are, you guessed it, group isomorphisms. Okay, an important aspect of category theory are the maps between different categories. These are called functors. A functor is like a function between sets. However, unlike sets, it also maps arrows to other arrows. The rule for functors is that it always takes identity morphisms to corresponding identity morphisms, and it takes a composition of arrows to a composition of arrows with the functor applied separately. These last two rules are important because it allows us to show that if two objects are isomorphic in one category, they are isomorphic when the functor is applied. In other words, functors preserve isomorphisms. An example of a functor is the classical forgetful functor on topological spaces. This maps each topological space to its underlying set without its topology, and maps each continuous function to its corresponding set function. So, why is this all relevant? Well, an important category of interest is the category of based homotopy spaces. The objects are topological spaces with an identified significant point, or a base point, but the arrows are instead equivalence classes of continuous maps. Basically, instead of each arrow being a continuous map, each arrow represents a collection of continuous maps that are all homotopic to each other. Okay, so our relevant functor for our base homotopy category is the fundamental group functor that takes each base homotopy space to its group of loops up to homotopy, and takes each class of continuous functions to its induced homomorphism of groups. In words that actually make sense now, we take a space and consider all loops that intersect our designated point. These are just curves that start and end at our base point. We can add loops together by splicing the beginning of one loop to the end of another. We consider two loops to be the same when they are homotopic. This forms a group because we can compose loops associatively. There is an identity element, namely the constant curve, and all loops can be undone to the constant curve under homotopy. If we do not consider loops specifically up to homotopy, then this would not create a group. So therefore, we have a well-defined functor from the category of based homotopy spaces to the category of groups, called the fundamental group functor. Now, this is where all the pieces come together. Consider we're in the based homotopy category, and we have two objects, the disk and the circle. We can assume that they have the same base point on the edge of the circle. Given our deformation retract G in the category of based homotopy spaces, G is an isomorphism. Obviously, when we compose the inclusion function of the circle with G, we have the identity on the circle, and when we compose G with the identity on the disk, we are given G again. But as we have shown previously, G is homotopic to the disk's identity function. Therefore, G gives us an isomorphism between the circle and the disk in the base homotopy category. This seems fine, however, this is actually not fine. If we apply the fundamental group functor to the circle and the disk, 
through some pretty trivial calculations made using covering spaces and the homotopy lifting property that you probably covered in the first half of high school. We can see that the fundamental group of the circle is isomorphic to z, the integers under addition, and the fundamental group of the disk is simply the trivial group. The way you can think about this is that all loops on the disk can be deformed into a point, and the number of loops around the designated point on the circle correspond to a unique integer. Well, the integers have an infinite number of elements, and the trivial group has only one. What does this imply? Well, this implies that the fundamental group of the circle cannot be isomorphic to the fundamental group of the disk. However, because we assume that G existed, the disk and the circle are isomorphic as based homotopy spaces, and functors preserve isomorphisms. This implies that their fundamental groups are isomorphic. This is the contradiction. They cannot be both isomorphic and not isomorphic. Therefore, our original assumption that there exists a function f from the disk to itself that does not admit a fixed point is incorrect. Furthermore, according to reductio ad absurdum, all continuous maps from the disk to itself admit a fixed point. Okay, to reiterate, we assume that there was a continuous function f that did not have a fixed point. We derived a deformation retract g from f, which was an isomorphism in the based homotopy category. Then, derived a contradiction because an isomorphism was not preserved through a functor. You want to know the craziest thing about this proof, though? It's entirely non-constructive. Nowhere in this proof do we ever specify where the fixed point is. We've only proven that it must exist. There you have it. We started with a simple statement, the Brouwer's fixed point theorem, and we proved it using the power of category theory. We were able to connect the powers of topology, homotopy theory, and group theory all to prove this simple statement. A way you can generalize from this example is if you want to show that two objects are not isomorphic in one category, it's sufficient to use a functor to show they're not isomorphic in a nicer category. The key categorical takeaway is that sometimes it's easier to solve a problem if you translate the problem to a different perspective. In our example, we transformed a topology problem into a problem of group theory. Anyways, this was a real application of category theory, just so you guys can get a concrete example of how category theory can be applied to your day-to-day -day life. And no, I will not be answering any questions related to functional programming, because programming is for losers. If you came to this video expecting functional programming tips, you got scammed. You just learned abstract math against your will. And before you go, make sure to stand growth and deke.